I still think about the ending of The Last of Us. I can't say I was the biggest fan of the story of Joel and Ellie. It wasn't in my list of all-time favorite game narratives, but sometimes our favorites are not always what haunt us. And that's precisely what The Last of Us does to me. It haunts me. My partner and I both played The Last of Us Part 1 around the same time, shortly after one another. The game's ending was a point of conversation for both of us. It still kind of is. Every once in a blue moon we bring it up. The game had an impact. Would you do what Joel did? Do you think Ellie knows? Are questions that we constantly revisit. The game had an impact. So both of us were really excited to play The Last of Us Part 2, however our path from the end credits of the first game to the title credits of Part 2 were wildly different. And frankly, I am jealous of her approach to the game, and I'm self-loathing about mine. It's this difference in experience, expectation, and sitting down with Part 2 that I want to talk about. I was excited for The Last of Us Part 2 because I was excited to see how the answers to these questions, you know, would Joel, would you do what Joel did and so forth, how they were going to be addressed in the sequel, if at all. I followed the lead up to the release, I watched trailers, I followed social media and mainstream gaming media outlets, I watched YouTubers gossip, I watched and read some reviews, but then I got absolutely lost in the deluge of insanity that followed. But for my better half, she basically just watched one of the official trailers and that was it. When she sits down to play The Last of Us Part 2, she does so with the sole, unadulterated, and innocent enthusiasm of wanting to see the story of Ellie and Joel continue and to shoot some clickers. When I sat down to play, I, I had that too, but I inadvertently saw all the backlash. I saw all the hate. I had things spoiled because trolls were trolls. The leaks happened. I couldn't avoid the headlines of the articles, arguments, and rants that followed. I couldn't avoid no, the quote, tweets of crazy, inflammatory, and bigoted nonsense. I couldn't parcel out spoiler-free reviews that talked about pacing without seeing stuff about the story. I saw the death threats directed at Laura Bailey. I saw the vitriolic wave of anti-Semitism directed at Neil Druckmann. And by the way, how does being Jewish have any effect on any of the still astounds me? I don't even know. It's just hateful. I saw the thumbnails, the tweets, the angry Reports, more death threats, gonna be more Soviet threats, more anger, more hate, more praise, more reductivism, more outrage, more and more and more and A part of me can't help but feel like I was sitting down to play part two to somehow receive a valid ticket to enter this crazy online arena. That I needed to play this game to like equip myself in my own private world to combat the frankly unreasonable rhetoric online, or to just prove someone wrong. Because there is just so much discussion about this game that it astounds me. It continues to astound me. I wasn't sitting down to play the game for my own reasons, not all the time, but because of other people's reasons. I'm not sitting down with my own expectations anymore, but expectations mired and muddied by the outrage and alarm of others. And I just think I ruined the game for me on some level. I did it to myself. It was totally self-inflicted and I'm an idiot. And I think if I avoided all of this, I would have had a different, had a better appreciation for part two. It would have been a more honest experience. So like, guys, let's put a caveat on this whole patient gaming thing. Because I waited patiently to buy this game. You need to be patient gaming plus for some of these big releases. You need to be a patient gaming hermit or a patient gamer who avoids social media or a patient gamer who like doesn't follow games. I wasn't any of this and I think I'm realizing more and more I need to be. My lesson, my observation is that following games, following discourse around games actually like undermines gaming. Maybe we could, you know, chalk this all up to that social media just ruins things in general and, you know, there's, there's that argument there. And maybe you just need to be like lights out on all of this, really. This is super difficult 
in addition as a gaming wannabe YouTuber because there is an unspoken expectation that I have to be quote unquote in the know or whatever. But like, I don't want to be in the know. I don't want to be in the know if it's going to ruin games. So for 2021, and going forward, I'm trying to not let context mar intent or have innocence lost to social media. It's really difficult because as someone who thinks about games, writes about games, talks about games, I want to follow and share my passion for gaming. But because of how media has become unleashed and unchecked in the gaming discourse, I don't know. Maybe I just have to be more willfully oblivious. Because all of this has undermined part two to have the same impact on me. I recently finished the game and it haunts me and it haunts me the same way that part one did. But I, there's this little voice in the back of my head that's just telling me like, would it have haunted me more? Would it have been more authentic and honest haunting if I didn't know some of those big spoilers going in? If I didn't know about all the hate? If I didn't know about the insanity that surrounded this game? And the fact that I have to ask that question just kind of makes me sad. And it saddens me to know that I probably lost something somewhere. So I hope I can do better in 2021 and beyond. I spent most of my single player gaming time last year playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey and I wish I had it. I'm a big AC fan, holy crap, like I have been, I have been since I laid eyes on the souks in Damascus as Altair in 2007, but 2007 was a different time. When I was a kid playing games, it was different, everything was different. Maybe I am less patient than I used to be, or maybe I value my time more, but one of the sentiments in gaming that I grapple with is this idea of that beating a game is required to talk about it. We've already slowly see this undermined and challenged as games move to a service and that the gaming press talks about impressions and that it's equally as important as gaming reviews and that how can you review a game in one point in time and think that, that it will still be relevant six months, nine months, 18 months from that point? It's so weird to talk about games sometimes. And it's also because there are just so many, many, many more games than there used to be. And they are considerably longer and denser and more complicated probably than ever before. One of the factors that makes gaming different than the world of books and movies is that how long to beat can be so drastically higher. Most people don't beat games. Yet we kind of assume we do. Josh Sawyer, the, one of the creative directors at Obsidian Entertainment, who's behind games like Fallout New Vegas and Pillars of Eternity and so forth, did this whole kind of expose about how most people didn't actually get that very far in any of his games, yet we kind of assume that people will have played it. But actually, majority of gamers don't beat games. A feature film is two hours-ish. A lot of people, when they sit down to watch a movie, can usually finish a movie, even if they hate it. Not really the same with games. A season of your favorite HBO series is like 10 hours or so. Popular audiobooks are maybe a dozen hours. Ghosts of Tsushima, one of the most completed games according to Sony's metrics, took me just shy of 35 hours. Odyssey took me 88. I wish I had stopped at 30. Sure, Odyssey had some moments of brilliance sprinkled throughout, but it was a game I played it at a sense of obligation rather than a sense of enjoyment. I maybe had fun for about the quarter of the time I played it. And so I'm killing this feeling of playing out of obligation, guys. I'm embracing something other media groups espouse casually. DNF. Did not finish. In BookTube, which is the YouTube community of book lovers and reviewers and critics, the DNF pile is a standard, the do not finish pile. It's everywhere on Goodreads and various book-oriented subreddits, and it's never dismissed or lambasted. It's just kind of like a norm that occurs now. Didn't like it, didn't finish it. I can't put my finger on it, but I feel like the same culture of letting go if we don't like a game isn't there. You still hear some very popular YouTube reviewers talk about, you know, like they don't have the time and they want to spend time playing games on the things that they have fun as a kind of framing an excuse for maybe why they're not talking about certain things and to, to try to shore up their defenses against any sort of criticism. You know, if we thought that DNF was just a casual thing, we wouldn't really have to say it anymore. Just like, didn't finish it, moving on. And so I'm telling you that like, I wanna start getting there. 
I'm telling you that we need to have this in the gaming community because as I get older, I value my time more. I value good games more because I was telling a friend the other day who like who has the time for mediocre games? There are so, so many good ones. I have piles of games that have received mountains of praise that I still haven't sat down and played. The lessons of having your own DNF is equally troublesome as trying to unfollow gaming media though. Because does that mean for me that I will always inherently critique things that I enjoy because the only things that I'm finishing are the things that I have fun with? And I guess when I say it aloud, it, like, it doesn't sound so bad. I actually think this is something that I just need to like fully embrace. I don't have time or energy to critique things I don't enjoy, which is hard, right? Like negativity and anger and pointed critiques gain a lot of traction. You kind of want to be holistic in your game knowledge and your game analysis. You want to have a, a wide kind of reaching survey to be able to offer meaningful insights. Like, you know, and developers need to be held to account when they do shitty things and bad games need to be called bad. But like, honestly, I'm not repeating the Odyssey incident. I'm not paid to do any of this. I'm not a paid critic. And I don't wanna talk about how I didn't like something, but still played it for several dozen hours anyways. Because who it's time to play mediocre games, guys? Like who, really who? I'll leave that to the people who are paid and are making money by slogging through unfun experiences. For me, inherently on this channel, I'm just accepting and embracing the fact that I wanna talk about games that I enjoyed. I think you can still have a critical discourse. I think fun games can still be problematic. I think there's still a space for this and I'll just happily have a DNF pile and stop feeling bad about it and start getting more excited when I sit down to play something that I enjoy, which will naturally translate into a script that I like writing and a video that I like editing and hopefully a message that is actually worth sharing. Hey everyone, hope you enjoyed this kind of two video in one style that I wanted to try out. Uh, this is the third and final part of a small series that I've done that spawned about last year when I wanted to sit down and make a gaming resolution for 2020 to only buy five games. Overall, it's been a pretty rewarding, thought-provoking, and reflective experience. So I definitely recommend watching the first two videos. Um, they may be coming back to this one to kind of reframe and you can get a sense of maybe how I've progressed and the things that I've learned and some of the insights that I've gathered. And yeah, anyways, I always love comments and engaging in conversation. So please drop a line and I'll see you all next time.